I mean, some people might be like, why isn't John talking? Just put in the, hmm. Oh, <laughs> oh wow. John, this is the show, oh, John. Shit. I'm not talking to you. Hmm. Guys on the side. I was putting this in. <laughs> Behind the curtain. Welcome back to another episode of 1980s Now, a weekly examination of the importance of 1980s pop culture and its influence today. My name is Will, and joining me as always are my friends and co-hosts, Kat and John. Hi, guys. hi Lee ho Hey, in addition to his co-hosting duties here, John also hosts his own podcast, Gen X Grown Up. Yeah, thanks. Hey, on today's show, we're going to be speaking with Jim Babjack, the founding member, songwriter, and guitarist for the Smithereens, mm-hmm. a group that uh, made it big in the 1980s. And mm-hmm. certainly I was a fan then. And they've got, mm-hmm. quote unquote, new music that just came out. And we'll yeah. explain what that means in a little while. Yeah. Uh, before that, though, we're going to review current news stories related to 1980s media, including... Who tried to ground Max? Oh, mm. nice. This 1981 movie that's coming to HBO as a series. <laughs> I'm sending you the name of the movie with my thoughts. <laughs> you didn't get it. Maybe you didn't get got it. Got it. Got it. Folks, yep. if you got it, hopefully the folks out there got it too. And the Eddie, other than Munson, will be rocking like it's 1986. Mm-hmm. That's a deep cut, Cat. You really, did you get what that one was? I, it's not really a deep cut for fans. Um, All right, I'm, See, because Kat knows the stories we're going to talk about. Yes, yes, so I do. So now it's like a game of match the stories with the dumb <laughs> Which piece. one goes with oh, this one? <laughs> I'm, you're matched. I, yeah. I got this, yeah. Oh, I'm matched, okay. <laughs> but do you know why? Okay. Hey, let's get caught up on 1980s news. He's the story. Now do the story. <laughs> so, hey, as reported by Q98.5, one Illinois jerk ruined all the Halloween fun. Mm-hmm. Or at least yep. he tried to. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> See, this just says jerk, but I can already say he because you know it's going to be a dude. Well, I guess not. I guess that's not true because we have this era of, quote, Karens that have right. risen. So this is. It could go maybe. either way. Okay. Well, all right. Yeah. So you remember last week we talked about Dave and Aubrey. They're the couple in, uh, mm-hmm. in a uh, suburb of uh, Chicago that uh, go crazy every Halloween year in the best of ways, just mm-hmm. decorating f- their lawn full out. Um, this year they spent over 1,500 hours creating a haunted display in front of their home. Wow, wow. And it drew a huge crowd because of, it probably does every year, but this one particular site that had uh, videos of it had over 14 million views on TikTok alone mm-hmm. was of Max from Stranger Things season four, just hovering like yep. she does in the show. Yes. You know, good 10 feet or so above. And they wouldn't reveal how she was doing that. And mm-hmm. last week we speculated, we gave, we gave our theories as to how that is. Mm-hmm. 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 Well, it just it turns out just two days after they revealed this, uh, there was a, na- a neighbor who was causing such a ruckus that uh, the the uh, the owners, uh, Dave and Aubrey, said they were going to shut the whole thing down, just take it all down and close it down. Mm-hmm. Uh, at that time on social media, Dave had posted, quote, due to an incident with a neighbor swinging a baseball bat like a total psycho because someone was waiting to pull out of their driveway as a young family walked past, mm-hmm. then twirling it around as a threat to all while also threatening my other neighbor. Uh, they will attack anyone they deem threatening to their property, and that is not safe. Mm-hmm. So for these reasons, they were they were going about to sh- shut it down. Oh, and we have right. live audio of the neighbor here. That's right. Really? Yeah. Hey, now you want to get nuts? Come on, let's get nuts. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so they had uh, they were ready to pull the whole thing down, and then they had such an outpouring of support they were reconsidering whether to do so or not. And so they, they said, "Hey, in a couple of days, we're going to make it a big announcement. We'll make a final decision, and we'll, we'll make a live mm-hmm. uh, stream on TikTok." And and they did. And after yeah. consulting with the police mm-hmm. and neighbors mm-hmm. and the neighborhood organization, they decided to keep that thing open. Yay. So that's good news. Yep. I saw something yep. that they have um, mm-hmm. a max number two. Oh. There's one oh, who really? hangs. Like someone else did it? So someone else no. did one or they did another nope. one in their yard? They have another one okay. because oh. if it's excessively windy, they are near Chicago, yeah. max number one uh. is in some jeopardy. So they have a Max number two who kneels on the ground in front of a tombstone <laughs> for, oh. on windy, really windy days. Oh. Like Bill, Billy's tombstone. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Huh. Uh, so that was pretty cool. cool and interesting. Does that mean they wind up taking the other one down, the floating one? I'm assuming so. When, mm. I, f- when I first started reading this, I started to get it because mm-hmm. like I, I sympathize with someone because, hey, there's this viral thing in our mm-hmm. yard. It's mm-hmm. a big deal. Everybody's driving around and it's right. irritating. Right, yeah. right, and I understand right. why you might be a little irritated by it, but allegedly swinging a bat, I guess there was some allegedly thrown in there because it's an accusation. But mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, if you're brandishing a weapon to people, I mean- it's, now you're the bad guy. Yeah, it's you, you've gone beyond. I'm a little irritated. Yeah. John, did anybody? Mm-hmm. Um, were there any ever any mobs of cars and people when you would dig a hole in your front yard <laughs> and, and pop out? No, of we it? had steady traffic, but no big mobs. Nobody ever <laughs> okay. brandishing a baseball bat. <laughs> yeah, John, I, I I think I would be this guy, you know. So I, in a sense, I wouldn't threaten anybody with a baseball bat. I, I think it's I could get mm-hmm. to that point, but mm-hmm. probably only if I if my, myself felt threatened. But I could see how, like you're saying to your point about it being so annoying. Like I think about those, uh, mm-hmm. you know, some of those folks who go all out every year with Christmas with the lights and now they've mm-hmm. got lasers and yeah, stuff yeah. synced to music and they're blasting music in front of their house. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I couldn't yeah. take it. I mean, now sure they say, well, it cu- cuts off at nine o'clock or whatever. Right. Oh, great. So we just have to live in, you know, uh, utter chaos and noise uh, until then. That's the trade off. <laughs> until nine. <laughs> so I just won't enjoy my, being in my own home till nine. <laughs> But this, I, I don't know. I guess maybe if I had kids playing, I would be <laughs> fearful for my kids playing outside while so many strangers are coming back and forth. That would yeah. be a concern, but. I mm. can understand too. But yeah, the baseball bat is going a little far. Unless maybe it, yeah. he he or she mistook uh, Max for a pinata. Uh, that's all I could think of, right? <laughs> <laughs> what would fall out of Max? <laughs> no full of candy? What's a, a bunch, stranger bunch, things? A bunch of cassette yeah. tapes. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, there you go. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was wondering if anybody came out by playing Kate uh, Bush, you know, uh, under there, sure. right. trying to be clever mm-hmm. as if the thing might come. Oh, if it came down, that would be something if he had anticipated <laughs> there we go, that. Right? That, that's next year's version 2.0, <laughs> if they don't have it already. <laughs> hey, in other 1980s news, per The Hollywood Reporter, David Cronenberg's scanners heads to HBO oh. as a series. No. Uh, okay. Uh, I've never even seen that movie, yeah. but that stood you out to me that? because of yeah. what I, like memes you know I've seen. It? Like Because okay. you, you live on the planet and you've seen, <laughs> right. you know what happens in scanners in that <laughs> like, one scene. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes. You know, the guy who's all wired up and he's like, you know, that <laughs> yeah, shot. That's and it. you know, that he, he shortly after there is his, uh, mm-hmm. his melon takes a powder. <laughs> so look, just like we've talked about a few episodes ago and almost every episode of our show now, you get skeptical about, you know, them taking an old property and, yeah. and bringing it new life. Yep. But uh, there's a couple, there's just several things that give me hope about this, including, you know, John, last week you were saying about time bandits. Why touch time bandits? It's, you know, just mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. sort of uh, perfect the way it is. Mm-hmm. Scanners is a movie to me that's fine. It made an impression upon me as a kid in the early 1980s because, you know, I was all of like 10 years old or 11 years mm-hmm. old when I saw it on video mm-hmm. and right. saw that horrific head exploding scene as a kid and was like, you know, this is looks awful and horrible and gory. And <laughs> practical, I'll point out, and which is even cooler. Yeah. What? Yeah. But yeah. the, uh, <laughs> they blew a guy's head off. <laughs> not, 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 not blowing the guy's practical. head off as practical as opposed to digital <laughs> cat. <laughs> Hey guys. <laughs> like that's that's a perfect way to deal with dudes. Blow their heads up. That's very practical. No, I mean it's real. The director's like, is this get actor any good? I mean, do, does he have a future or uh, do you have family? Mm. No. All right, let's do it practically. Want this shit to look real. All right. Um. <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, the movie's fine. It's fine. So it could stand to have it. You know, look, I like David Cronenberg and some of his older, later stuff. And it's always weird and trippy. But um, mm-hmm. anyway, so I think it, it could stand for a, a new polish or a fresh take. And maybe having a series is more of a way to explore it. Okay. Mm-hmm. But the mm-hmm. folks that are involved give me encouragement too, because you've got William Bridges, who won an Emmy for co-writing the USS Callister episode of... Uh, Black mm-hmm. Mirror? Mm-hmm. John, are you a Black Mirror fan? You have to at least of course. see that one. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Love Black Mirror and that one where they were kind of, the guy was like a super nerdy kind of Trekkie, though they didn't call out Trek. Yes. And he lived out this adventure uh, on this ship. And he was kind of a tyrant and a, an asshole. And, yes. And yeah, it was, yeah. Of kidnapper course and yeah, all these horrible mm-hmm. things. But the yep. Star Trek illusions, yeah, I would imagine you would like. Oh. Super good. Yeah, it was great. So him, and also, so he's going to be the showrunner, but along with someone whose name I'm going to say is Yan... Demange, maybe it's Yan Demange, Y A N N D E M 
A N G E. I almost thought it was like a wrestler's name, like <laughs> Yon Damage or something. Yeah. A medieval wrestler. Yon Damage. <laughs> Yon Damage is an uh, over. <laughs> this person's name, who I'm terribly butchering, helmed the pilot for HBO's Lovecraft Country, which mm. I I loved that uh, movie or TV series too. Unfortunately, it got canceled. But mm. mm-hmm. and finally, David Cronenberg, who wrote and directed the original film, is going to be the executive producer. So mm-hmm. I think it stands a chance to make it right. good. Feeling hopeful. And yeah. it's not a reboot or a remake of Scanners. It's, it's supposed to live in that universe. Just show me mm-hmm. more. I, I, that's the kind of thing I can get behind. So mm-hmm. it, for folks mm-hmm. who don't know, I guess, because we're talking about it for a while now without really explaining, it's it's a movie, the story's about, a, a, in this world, there's a small group of people who have various, you know, telekinetic, telepathic, psychic powers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. One group is a good group and one group is a bad, that's in the world. There's a <laughs> bad group of, they're referred to as scanners. Mm-hmm. Um, but Michael Ironers, Ironside plays this guy who's power hungry and wants to sort of, you know, uh, weaponize the, the, the folks with scanner powers, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. uh, to take over the world. Um, and mm-hmm. his is, uh, you know, obviously they're trying to stop him. He, and Michael Ironside's character is the one who infamously explodes another guy's head. Oh. Um, uh-huh. During a conference. I mean, during, during a conference in front of an audience. Um, but wow. anyway, but, but the, so that's what it's about. But the new series is saying it. Yeah. Practically. <laughs> practical thing to do. I mean, sure. I mean, doesn't have a wife, not children, nothing. All right. No, it's fine. No future. Go, Go for it. Okay. I mean, yeah. this guy isn't like a, an Al Pacino or Robert De Niro type, right? He's not a future in acting. All right. No. Okay. Arm the charges. Um, We're going to go for it. So <laughs> this new series is being described as, uh, being set in that world of the film where, mm-hmm. where it's going to focus on two women that are, are being pursued by agents you know, uh, with that have these types of powers okay. and must learn to work together to topple this uh, conspiracy that uh, is determined to bring them to heel, which is kind of similar to some of the elements of the stories in the original film. Mm-hmm. But, um, mm-hmm. but yeah, regarding that iconic head exploding scene, which Kat, I guess you've only seen a gif of it. Right. Just, yeah. Like a cartoony <laughs> representation of that scene that you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. in the movie, again, it happens. There's sort of a panel of people talking about, mm-hmm. You know, these, I think they're talking about the psychics, the, the scanners and mm-hmm. Michael Ironside's character, who is a scanner, just <laughs> blows up the guy's head. No, John, no! <laughs> hey, relax, it doesn't have that kind of range. <laughs> oh, Someone in South Carolina, though, just exploded. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, oh, well, good. <laughs> can't go past the Carolinas. <laughs> collateral damage. Um, I'm so glad your Wi-Fi is fritzing out. <laughs> Otherwise, um, you're done. I kind of got, I, I got a little migraine, though. I got a Did migraine. You? Yeah. Kind Did of you migraine. get a floater and you know, all of a sudden? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got a floater. <laughs> that's a, that's the first symptom. Exploding heads next. <laughs> Starting. It starts with a floater. Uh, but that iconic scene, like John pointed out, was practical. It was the early 1980s. It couldn't be anything but. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but um, like, uh, you know, many of these effects then and today, it's a series, it took a series of trial and error before they found the right mix of things to make it look mm-hmm. real. Mm-hmm. Ultimately, uh, they created a, a plaster skull with a gelatin inside of it, mm-hmm. and they packed it with various scraps of latex, some wax, and bits of leftover stringy stuff. <laughs> and according to the guys who, who did the uh, special effect, leftover burgers. Oh, oh. no. Mm. Oh. Now, when it came time to actually make it explode, though, they tried a bunch of different type of explosive techniques and none of them created the effect as they imagined it would be. So mm-hmm. Gary Zeller, who was the effects supervisor, mm-hmm. told his crew, roll the cameras, everybody get in the trucks, close the doors, get down, close the windows. And after they were safely away, he took a shotgun, ducked <laughs> down behind the, uh, the fake body. What? <laughs> Out of sight behind this, you know, behind the body and blew its head oh. off with a shotgun. Wow. Yeah. T- talk about practical. That's that how to get it done. <laughs> I mean, thank goodness he didn't hurt anybody. Yeah. Oh, right. Shotgun. Hey, in other 1980s news, the British heavy metal band Iron Maiden has announced its first tour dates. Hmm. So beginning in June, the band will perform a series of concerts in Europe and the UK that they're calling Cat. You know what they're calling their tour? Am I allowed to point this out? I because mean, I must, I'm guessing they're fans. It involves mentioning yeah. a certain something that you don't want me mentioning <laughs> I anymore. I didn't. Did I say that? I kind of said that. <laughs> Maybe I did. Funny. Yeah. The name yeah. of their tour is is so close to yeah. uh, the name of 
Duran Duran's recent tour. Mm-hmm. So close. I think there's just a the. Oh, okay. Well, let's see. Mm-hmm. So their tour is called, is it called, is there's the, the future Duran past Duran tour. Duran Duran is future past and yeah. mm-hmm. Iron Maiden is the future the past. The future past <laughs> tour. All right. So they escape any kind of trademark. I guess. Or- <laughs> Technically and legally differentiated yes. and unique from Duran Duran's right. tour. So yes, we are going to be selling the same t-shirts, but that's just a coincidence. <laughs> I just realized now we got to get Iron Maiden to come near Cat and do a concert, you know, sometime early next year. So she gets tickets for the future, the future past tour. <laughs> and is there, I can't wait. This it's is fantastic. I, I wanted to see it again. And yeah. Iron Maiden oh, comes out. Lordy. <laughs> Oh, mix up. So you want to do the old switcheroo on poor cat? She's there with her, her, her D2 shirt and she's got her mm-hmm. banners and everything. And then here comes Iron Maiden. So Iron Maiden uh, first formed in, in 1975, but uh, look, they became huge in the 1980s, certainly among mm-hmm. the metal community. I don't know. They certainly didn't have, uh, didn't get the mainstream uh, success or, or notoriety as like a Metallica, for example, which mm-hmm. was more of a, had more sort of crossover success, but certainly folks that know rock and roll have heard of Iron Maiden. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Well, and then on their tour now, they're, they're planning to play selections from their newest album, which actually harkens back to 2021, mm-hmm. which I'm guessing is Senjutsu. Senjutsu. Okay, Kat, yep. you're mm-hmm. the uh, okay. J- Japanophile. What's Senjutsu? Oh, I forgot to look it up, but it's definitely- Oh, I thought maybe you knew. And I, I don't, <laughs> That's I, how you pronounce it. Well, <laughs> to me, it, it would be just off the top of my head, it, yeah. it's a, a style of, of um, martial art. Yeah. Like okay. the style of, yeah. Oh, I wonder okay. if the, yeah. the reservation, yeah. so we got Sen Say. Mm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So maybe Sen, maybe there's something in there. I don't know, Kat, you'll figure it out. I should have looked this know. up earlier. Yeah. So even though they plan <laughs> on playing some tracks from that, the latest album, as most often bands, you know, sort of do a mix or focus on a newer album, this leg of the tour, they're going to focus instead on a 1986 album, Somewhere in Time, mm-hmm. in addition to throwing yeah. out some, some other uh, classic cuts. Um, they've been their latest, their earlier leg of the tour, Legacy of the Beast. Uh, they were playing of some more songs from uh, this Senjutsu. Oh, but they're changing it up. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, play the hits anyway. Free um, bird. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, it, it, I tried to find this. This I had found this information earlier, and then I couldn't find it again. But it seems like this is something, and folks of Iron Maiden listening will will know. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Please write me and let me know. Well, at 1980s now, but it it seems like they've done this before, where they they you know they're doing a more a tour now but they, do, they, they recreate a tour from, you know, 30 years ago. Oh. So this isn't the first time it seems that they've done this, you okay. know? Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, which, I don't know. It's kind of clever, I guess. It's kind of like, you know, not only we're going to play the hits from that era, let's just mm-hmm. do the, mm-hmm. you know, the vibe and the style. And mm-hmm. I don't know how far they take it, but I, and I, I'd like to know, because in particular, mm-hmm. the Iron Maiden's known for, you know, having f- somewhat theatrical shows, which uh-huh. include this character, which I, the only thing I knew about Iron Maiden when I was a kid was this character, their mascot, Eddie. Right. That's oh. the, the skinless, demonic guy who's on the cover, I think, like yeah. every album in some form or fashion. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So he began as a, uh, apparently he began as a paper mache mask <laughs> used uh, in some of their early uh, performances as a stage backdrop. Uh-huh. Um, there's some different, uh, ideas as to how it got the name Eddie. Um, but, uh, one, one is that he, it sounds like in there with their English accents, they're saying head because he just was a head. So it became Ed. Yes. Uh, anyway, so once Iron Maiden had secured a record contract with EMI, their manager, Rod Smallwood decided that the band needed quote, the one figure who utterly stamped his presence and image on the band Mm -hmm. end quote. So, um, after seeing artwork, on a Max Middleton poster, they set up a meeting with Derek Riggs, this mm-hmm. artist, and asked him to do some illustrations. Mm-hmm. And he took something that was originally an idea for a punk record, and uh, they mo- he modified it to suit the band's uh, particular look and tastes and in music, including giving it uh, some extra hair. <laughs> <laughs> they t- yeah, took the name from the paper shade mask, Eddie, and this figure was born. Wow. Either of you guys now or previously metalheads? No. Not really? Not yeah. in the past, present, or future. That sounds too far <laughs> into the culture. Too far into it, yeah. It was definitely a click. And it's it's one they don't talk about a ton, right? You had the the jocks and the nerds and the band geeks and whatever, but there were also like mm-hmm. the metalheads in my school. Oh, yeah. And, oh, oh, yeah. I mean, they had, I mean, every metalhead had at least mm-hmm. one, at least one Iron Maiden shirt that was the baseball uh-huh. shirt. It was black 
with Eddie on it oh. and it had the white sleeves yeah. that are cut off across this way. Right. Okay. And it's like, you could just see them from a distance. They looked like they were a baseball yeah. team from hell because they had these baseball jerseys <laughs> and they all had these demons and, and mummies mm-hmm. on them and stuff. And, and uh, yeah, uh-huh. I only know mm-hmm. Iron Maiden from the hits, but it was the, Im- the imagery, the iconography really mm-hmm. is what stamped its presence on my memory. Even though I wasn't a metalhead, uh, it was, right, it was, right. it was prevalent. It, Record store, if they had posters up, one of them was Iron Maiden because it just yeah. looks so cool. Sure. And, and, and I, I, mm-hmm. John, mm-hmm. I couldn't even name a song, you know? So but Eddie, for me, was the only thing I really knew about the band. Mm-hmm. And, and quite honestly, when I was younger and the band was just starting out and I, I had friends and family members that were metalheads, as you say, and they were more into it. Mm-hmm. I found him kind of like a scary figure. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I'm not sure how, maybe it was a an 80s commercial promoting a concert, mm-hmm. but I remember where I saw, the, or maybe it was a music video where you saw that Eddie made concert appearances. And that was fascinating to me. Hmm, really? <laughs> if you guys don't know, uh, Smallwood, the manager claims that uh, the the managing director of EMI at the time came up with this idea that Eddie would be a part of the concerts. And mm-hmm. so uh, originally the manager of Smallwood played Eddie uh, and he would wear an Eddie mask in a leather jacket and dress <laughs> kind of like John was describing his metalheads. Wow. But they had him on like stilts that would, mm-hmm. would make him t- 10, 12 feet tall. Uh-huh. <laughs> and this is a tradition that continued through all their concerts. Oh, so Eddie wow. would be made up to match, again, the style of the album and therefore the tour. So uh-huh. when he's uh-huh. mummified, you know, it's more mm-hmm. of an Egyptian looking set. Mm-hmm. And it evolved into having giant Eddie's, like a 30 foot tall, like <laughs> head in the back looming that would sort of rise above the, you know, uh, above the- Now uh, they can just go to Home Depot band. and buy the 30 foot skeleton. <laughs> <laughs> just yeah, right. Yeah. In jaws and they're set, but exactly. yeah, inflate it, stick it on your lawn. <laughs> right. <yeah. laughs> but uh, at some point in the concert, a twelve foot Eddie in some form or another, you know, depending mm. on the style, would mm-hmm. come lumbering on. Made an appearance. And that for me, again, seeing a video or a commercial, I thought that was terrifying as a kid. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I want to see that. I, I don't know. I trust he's not going to start murdering people. I would have gone the other way for sure. If you're a metalhead, that's probably the highlight of the concert. Right. They're waiting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Waiting yeah. for that moment. Yeah. yeah. What was surprising to me to learn is that uh, during these concert appearances of Eddie's, he wasn't an ally of the band. You know, some of these oh. little, some of the interaction with the band were with them, him fighting with the band, like him trying to attack the band. <laughs> really? The band fighting back. <laughs> oh. Um, there's one scene, I think it's, it's the drummer or the guitarist, grabs a hold of his giant head and pulls his top of his skull off and starts pull, scooping his brains <laughs> out. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> and one of them, Bruce Dickinson, the lead singer, pulls a heart out of his chest. And like throws it into a fire. I mean, it's. See, I thought they would have been buddies. Well, no. <laughs> yeah. That's a party. So oh my gosh. <laughs> I mean, maybe that makes it scarier. Uh, I don't know. Was his brain like gel and and bits of string and hamburger? <laughs> and burger, yes. and burgers. <laughs> nice <Yep>. callback. <laughs> Michael Ironside walks on. <gasps> I would, you definitely want to be in the splash zone and have one of those Gallagher type rain jackets on. <laughs> the 30 foot Eddie head explodes. Yikes. I looked up oh. Senjutsu. Okay. Uh, it's a Japanese term that loosely translates as tactics and strategy, but can huh. also refer mm. to skill, technique, trick, resources, and most interestingly, magic. They're tricking us that. with nostalgia. They're tricking people into coming to the show by recreating <laughs> mm-hmm. a nostalgic concert that they've done with a nostalgic album mm-hmm. for the 80s. So it's appropriately named. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. All right. Mm-hmm. Hey, another 1980s news. It's almost like breaking news. This just in. The trailer for Super Mario Brothers. John, when did, Super, when did we first meet Super Mario Brothers? We know we first met Mario yeah. in the arcade game uh, Donkey Kong, where he's right. referred to as Jumpman. That's right. Time. I used mm-hmm. to play that all the time. But at yeah, some yeah. point, uh, this morphed into Super Mario Brothers. Do you, do you know when it, I, I meant to look well, it up. And it would have to be it. the advent of the NES when they added Super yes. Mario. So that's got to be like mm-hmm. 86, 87. I'm not an NES baby because by then I was on the computers, but I do know that my mm-hmm. girlfriend's little brother had an NES and he was mm-hmm. an addict. So it had to be 86, 87. I used the theme song as a tool yesterday at work mm-hmm. because one little guy in my classroom really didn't want to wash his hands. Mm-hmm. And so I said, well, let's, let's do a little song to help us while washing okay. hands. And I thought, oh, he likes Mario Brothers. Yeah. So I started going, <laughs> do, 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 oh. do, 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 do. And then, then he was all in. 
<laughs> and he, he did the job. Get some <laughs> soap, <laughs> then turn on the water yes. and scrub your hands. I through. need yeah, to. Exactly. Yeah, pull yes, lyrics. I, I need to so, put words. I need to put words. I was words. so hoping Cat had lyrics. I, I, not yet, <laughs> but so now I'm going to work on that. <laughs> yeah. So I'll sing it. Cat is my companyist, and then uh, yeah, yes. we'll go on the road. So, there you go. <laughs> yeah, before we had Super Mario Brothers, we had the Mario Brothers. Remember the 1983 arcade game where you mm-hmm. had a, uh, you could, mm-hmm. it was a dual player game or a yes. single player game where you had to flip over turtles and crabs. Mm-hmm. I loved that game. Mm-hmm. It was so simple, but uh, well, the thing about love early about video games, early video games just generally is with very little could just spark imagination and a sort of a sense of adventure. You know, mm-hmm. that was one of those games for me that mm-hmm. it never left that one screen, but it was just, I don't know. It was exciting to play it. Yeah. And the Mario brothers notably is when Mario changed professions. He initially was a carpenter and then he became a plumber. Mm-hmm. Oh, mm-hmm. so when was he a carpenter in okay. Donkey Kong? He was a carpenter in Donkey Kong. That's why, that's why the giant hammer that he's, he's a carpenter. Okay. He, oh, yep, right. Yep, yep. He initially okay. was a carpenter right. and I guess that wasn't paying or maybe his license expired. Yeah. <laughs> and he decided to become a plumber <laughs> instead. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they're going to cover that in the movie. He wasn't yeah. making bank. So, yeah. No. <laughs> so techni- right. technically Mario Brothers was the first in the Super Mario series. Mm-hmm. Were the ladders that he climbed wood or metal? Did he make the ladders? I don't know if he made the ladders or not. Mm. Well, they're girders. Yeah, they're metal mm-hmm. I love when Kat asks us questions that we don't know, can't possibly yeah. have answers to. Like, does Marcus like the movie? Uh, <laughs> oh, right. I still want to know the answer to that. <laughs> how many licks of a Tootsie Roll Pop? To, to the center. We don't know, Kat. Three. <laughs> oh, three. That's right. That we have the answer oh, to. One, we know that already. Two, okay. Three. <laughs> anyway, eventually, as John suggested, this was, uh, you know, created. We had a we had a, a port of it at least created uh, for the, well, first Famicom in Japan, no doubt, a, mm-hmm. years, a couple of years early before we had the NES and okay. then ultimately on the NES. Anyway, so look, it's born, my whole point is it's born in the 1980s. You guys did that already. That's but right. So they turned it, mm-hmm. we turned it to a movie and, and, you know, we talked about it when it was first announced this movie was going to come out and the first concern was Chris Pratt was cast as playing Mario Brothers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. a lot of questions. Is this cultural appropriation of plumbers? Because he's not a plumber. <laughs> he's an actor. So that yeah, was one concern. <laughs> Second concern was, is he going to do the, it's me voice like uh, Charles uh, Martinet had, uh, you know, created uh, so many years yeah. ago. Mm-hmm. It's it's too early to tell from the trailer because we get only about yeah. two and a half lines of dialogue and a couple of oofs and ahs out of him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, You can hear he's putting on a li- he's a little bit of an effect of an accent, just a little bit. It's not just straight Chris Pratt. Mm-hmm. Okay. But it's too mm-hmm. early for me to make a call. What I did buy into was yeah. Jack Black as Bowser. That <gasps> that's Jack Black. Seriously? He nailed that. Yes, I had no idea. Oh, okay. Wow. Yep. Perfect. <laughs> He's standing there now. Who will stop me? And it's oh yeah, it's straight up. Okay, straight up. School oh. of Rock. Jack Black just getting into it. I loved it. Oh, so wow. <laughs> I think the Chris Pratt thing is suspicious. I agree mm-hmm. with you. The first two words he said, I thought sounded like he was doing an English accent, and I was like, mm-hmm. What is this? Oops. Yeah. And then suddenly he was doing like a New York City accent, maybe. <laughs> but he's all of maybe five words he says. And so I think maybe they're, I don't know if they've got it figured out that we got a Sonic the Hedgehog type situation where they're going to realize. They could tweak mm-hmm. it. Yeah. Post trailer. Yeah. Right. yeah. Now the visuals are stunning. Yes. Right. It's now we've seen lots of really nice cutscenes in like, um, uh, it was the Super Smash Brothers and stuff where they, they have done video vignettes and scenes to introduce characters and yeah. stuff. So it's sort of the first time we've seen these characters cinematically presented, but mm-hmm. right. then in the trailer, there's like a, there's extra texture. There's extra lighting. There's, there's a weight oh to gosh, it. Yes. There's, there's a realness mm-hmm. to it that goes beyond, you know, and even stuff isn't like the mushroom kingdom you see for a second. It's not even like super candy coated. It has just mm-hmm. a little bit of reality and they kind of mm-hmm. made like Mario's about, you know, 5% realer looking than he would be in a game. I mean, yep. the visuals I think are great. So in that case, yeah. not a Sonic problem, but maybe <laughs> yeah. the voice can be tweaked. Yeah. Yeah. I noticed the penguins that are in there, you know, one lifts its wing and you can see like the little hairs uh-huh. on the wing. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Little pin little feathers shimmery. in there or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. yeah. Is it pin feathers? I'm calling yeah. it hairs. I was paying more attention to the penguins than I was to Mario's voice. So I need to yeah. rewatch that again. I was forgetting all about Chris Pratt. <laughs> I, I do think that opening is like a Lord of the Rings or, mm-hmm. A, mm-hmm. you know, Dungeons and Dragons. Hopefully with Dungeons mm-hmm. and Dragons, as you wouldn't know it's a Mario Brothers till it starts, you know, to Bowser actually mm-hmm. appears. Yep. Mm-hmm. 
I did not catch that as Jack Black. That first line when he says, open the gates, mm -hmm. struck me as a straight up like a Mad Max Road Warrior homage to Lord Humongous. Right. Oh. And I, he, he, Lord Humongous might even say open the gates uh -huh. in the movie because he's trying to get into the, you know, the Citadel or right. whatever mm -hmm. to call it, mm -hmm. where they have the, the guzzling. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it seemed a little sillier than, uh, you know, at times, but I don't know, maybe they're going to balance it out because yeah, it's so dark to start. And uh -huh, like uh -huh. John says kind of gritty. So maybe the silliness is kind of just a nice little, mm -hmm. gets it in the sweet spot. I watched a little bit of their, their announce when Miyamoto was there kind of talking about, you know, welcome everyone. Mm -hmm. And they talked to the guy that ran illumination studios. Who's the, uh, uh, the company that's doing the animations, the minions, people, the, 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 the right. guru guy anyway. <laughs> uh, but during that, you know, they, they really hammered home that, this is designed to appeal to not just kids, not just adults, mm -hmm. not just adults who played the games, oh, but it's for people of all ages. There's stuff in there for everyone. So cool. having a little bit dark and just, it's right on that edge. It's like kids want a little bit scary, but not so scary. They cover their eyes, but just enough mm -hmm. that they feel the weight of it. And, mm -hmm. you know, like our cartoons, they got to put a little wink and nod to us here and there and got to be mm -hmm. Easter eggs mm -hmm. and references. I mean, it's their first time out of the gate making an animated Mario. They got to go whole hog or whole Bowser. That, I guess that's my other thought too. They've been so guarded about that uh, property that if all these folks, including Miyamoto, mm -hmm. who, uh, you know, created these characters, mm -hmm. waiting for John to correct me if I'm wrong, no. created these characters, <laughs> um, <laughs> is signed off on it and says, hey, this is it. Finally, we got it. Because, you know, mm -hmm. infamously, uh, well, not infamously, uh, there's, uh, I don't know that it's urban legend, right? That there was supposedly like a Zelda movie that well, they got to like 80% done or 75% and they just shelved, they canned it. The whole thing. Like no one will ever see it. Oh, wow. But they did a lot of work on it, I thought. Mm. Oh, boy. This film has been in production hmm. for over seven years. Wow. Seven what? years. So you can imagine yeah. the iteration that has gone on where, mm -hmm. did you know that Mario was supposed to be in Wreck-It Ralph and then later in Wreck-It Ralph 2, but the last minute, every time Nintendo pulled the plug because they said he wasn't properly represented. Oh, mm. my so gosh. So we've tried. But and somehow they- okay. <laughs> Now we know. It's because they had this in the chamber. They're waiting to do their own. Okay. And yet they mm -hmm. cast Chris Pratt. <laughs> How did he get past? Does that feel like stunt keepers? casting? It's like, give somebody well, else the yeah. work. Does he got enough jobs? You know. And the other he thing is, is like, yeah. you know, he did that voice in the Lego movies. It's like, is it going to be all that different? Or is it just going to be, mm. I don't know. We'll see, I guess. Yeah. He's cool. talking like a dish. I'm a Mario. Hey, <laughs> I'm walking here. I'm, I'm, I'm falling off of him. Oh, you know, it reminds me. Well, whatever. We've talked enough about this. <laughs> all right. Hey, that was 1980s news. <laughs> Hey, our independent podcast is brought to you every week by folks just like you. So if you'd like to help us out, please follow us on the podcast platform you're listening to right now. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, share an episode on Facebook. All of these actions just take a moment and are 100% free. But if you'd like to chuck in a buck and help us keep publishing the show week after week, please visit us at 1980snow.com slash support to find out how you can send us a dollar or two. And thank you so much. It means a lot. All right, so hey, in a moment, as we mentioned, we're gonna bring out Jim Babjack, singer, mm -hmm. songwriter, guitarist for the Smithereens. I love mm -hmm. the Smithereens. There's something iconic about their music that I associate mm -hmm. with the 1980s, mm -hmm. but only a memory in particular, someone that came out in 1988 on their album, Green Thoughts. Uh -huh. well, the only time I ever played with the band, you know, a rock and roll band mm -hmm. was- Oh, uh, th you said the band, like you played with the Smithereens. A band, oh, not the band. played with I'm the like, band. It was just this one time I played with them in Secaucus. It was yeah. amazing. And, and no. John didn't bat an eye. Like, yeah, that's it. that makes sense. <laughs> of course you did. Of course he'd lie about that too. Um, but no, my, my friend of mine, you know, a friend of mine from elementary school, you know, we were still friends today. Mike, he asked me to, f They were. I think he had just put this band together and he needed a keyboardist. So he, oh. I, you know, I played- uh, will you play keyboards for this bit? I was terrified. You know, oh, I, I never mm -hmm. played live other than an occasional recital when I was very young. Uh -huh, mm -hmm. So now to play band and, you know, and they were doing a gig at a college in Long Island. I'm trying to remember which one it was. Uh -huh. Hofstra. It was Hofstra University. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, it's for college kids. And I, I was still in high school. I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure. What mm -hmm. kind of music? Yeah. I was doing covers. You had covers mm -hmm. of the police in excess. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Nice. Nice. Uh, some David Lee Roth solo stuff like, uh, you know, Huh? This does be just like living, living in, in paradise. paradise. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah. And the Smithereens song, Only a Memory, was oh, one of them. Oh, yeah. wow. So okay. I have good yeah. feelings about this group, and, and in mm -hmm. particular, one really fond memory that's associated with this song. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And nice. <laughs> boy, I was terrified. 
these guys to this day are uh, my friend Mike and his buddies, such amazing, accomplished musicians, mm -hmm. uh -huh. you know, and I was the oddball that was like sweating out, like, <laughs> like really having to concentrate what chord is next. <laughs> Word that I'm just gonna screw up the whole thing. Oh. They they didn't let me have a mic that was live, but they gave me mic so it looked like I was mic, singing. So it looked like yes. you were there. Yeah. Oh, so you were just you. I were... was just singing, but no one could hear it. Oh my right. gosh. <laughs> oh my god. What it but was hey, fun. it was a blast. The groupies made it all worth it. I'm sure. Oh. Hmm. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, for the first time, I did feel kind of like uh, the only time, rather, I ever felt like a rock star because there were some young ladies, college students. Again, I was in high school. They came to the stage and were like, "Yay!" And one of them was saying to me, um, "Sing louder, sing, sing louder. louder!" I swear, your mic, tap your mic. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. I was like, I don't, I don't know. Is something wrong with the engineer? The mix is off. You know? She's like, I can't hear you. I want to hear you. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> Yeah, all right. Nobody does, Believe apparently. Me. I'm trying to concentrate. What's in the C chord? C, uh, D7 e. diminished. Ah, oh, crap. That's oh, an no. E. What? <laughs> we didn't cover that. That's when amazing. I was eight. Um, so I don't know how. Look, we're not going to get to talk. I guess, I guess this is where I reveal something, right? Yes. All right. So mm. just as a side note, those who are really paying attention, mm -hmm. we already recorded the interview and John couldn't be there. So it was just Kat and I. So I know mm -hmm. what we're going to talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why John's going to be quiet. Not that he, he has anything against his parents. <laughs> there. Because normally I would never be quiet. You can be rest assured. <laughs> if anybody's listened, they yeah. know. <laughs> they know. Right. That's they know. True. You're right. right. It's the first time that guy shut up. Um, Amazing. So I'll pretend like, now I'll pretend like I didn't say any of that. So look, I don't know what stories we'll get to talk to Jim about, but, um, mm -hmm. so we may not get to this story with Jim. I don't know. Mm. But, um, so one of the songs, so look, it, it, they, they have had music in tons of films. Yeah. So you may not even realize how much of a Smithereens fans you are, a fan you are, but focusing on the 1980s films, we're talking about more than a dozen films have had their songs in it, but wow. focusing on 1980s films alone, dangerous. And some of these you might not have heard of because they're smaller films, but some of them you most definitely did. Uh, dangerously Close, Burglar, I Was mm. a Teenage Zombie, mm. Under the Boardwalk, Bull Durham. Mm. Really? Wow. Yes. Mm -hmm. Nice. They've uh, performed wow. on a number of different the TV shows, Saturday Night Live, The Tonight Show. Sure. I, I mentioned the movies because there's a movie that they almost had a song in, and I don't know if we'll get to talk to Jim about it. Oh, okay. Um, and and, and mm. the reason why they, they ultimately didn't have the song in the film is because the writer of the film, mm -hmm. did he also direct the film? Hmm, I don't know if I don't remember. Mm. Said that the song gave too much away. Oh. Too much of the story of the film away? Yes. Really? It's one of their biggest hits songs. Uh-huh. Uh, and um, I'm going to read you some of the lyrics, see if okay. you can tell what movie mm, it, it was. And once again, it's, it's time, time to, to play. play. You've got to be <laughs> kidding. <laughs> This is how John feels every time I mention there's going to be a game. No, I love the games. <laughs> well, then, you know, I expect you to speak up a lot during this interview, John. <laughs> I will do. All right. And more wow. than just, hmm, yeah. Wow. He'll speak up while he's listening to it. <laughs> yeah. You need a, you need right, a genuine so, uh, contributor. So uh, when, 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 when Pat, the late... Uh, late, uh, you know, co-founder and lead singer and, and, and songwriter of, of the group, Pat uh, Denizio, mm -hmm. uh, was given the, uh, he was shown the movie. I believe he was shown the movie. Mm -hmm. He was given the script. He was given the script at least. Mm -hmm. And okay. so he knew what it was going to be about. And again, so the creator of the film said that that's too close. We you can't have that out here. Uh -huh. All right. So here you go. I'm just going to give you some various lyrics here. So sure. here, it opens with this line. And maybe if you know the song, you're going to get it. Okay. You know what song it is. I can just tell you what it is. It's a song, Girl Like You. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I used to travel in the shadows, but I never found the nerve to try and walk up to you. Mm -hmm. But now I'm a man, and I know there's no time to waste. There's too much to lose. Mm -hmm. All right, here's another line. First love, heartbreak, tough luck, big mistake. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I won't yeah. walk and I won't run. I believe in you. London, Washington, anywhere you are, I'll run. Hmm. I'll say anything you want to hear. I'll see everything through. I'll do anything I have to do just to win the love of a girl like you. Wow. It, that, yeah, that's all right there. <laughs> it's a film that came out in 1989. And, and when I just read those lyrics to you, I actually said the title of the film. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you is guys it, know what it is? is it? John, think, go ahead and say is it, it. Is it say anything? That's me! I wanted you to get a power up. <laughs> Instead of the... Bah, bah. In honor of the Mario movie. <laughs> That's the one I usually get in the music game. So what gave it away? Was was that, you, you know, I don't know that. 
I, I don't think mm-hmm. that I would have gotten anything from yeah, the film about so, this, except so, I had, if I had seen the film. Yeah, so yeah. honestly, it, for me, it was just, there are so many 80s films that are about mm-hmm. the guy who can never approach the girl, then he finally yeah. works up the courage, and he finally, and, and I'm like, well, that doesn't narrow it down. And no, then right? when I heard you yeah. say, say anything, I'm like, it mm-hmm. does fit that one. And why mm-hmm. would that, that phrase didn't flow naturally in the lyrics. Like it felt a little bit wedged in, like we okay. got to say, say okay. anything in here. So <laughs> really no. it was just an educated guess because it could fit, but I wasn't certain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyway. So, yeah. um, and we'll talk about that. They have a new album. It's pretty cool. We'll ask, we'll ask, um, I could assure you, we'll, we'll get time to ask Jim about the new album, which is really right. a song. It was really an album they created in the early 1990s. Mm-hmm. Uh, and sounds very similar to the music they created uh, during the 1980s. And it's just a fantastic album. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Give the people what they like. Yeah. All right. So, hey, in a moment, we'll be right back with Jim Badjack. I came here in a time machine that you invented. Now, I need your help to get back to the year 19... 19... Our guest today is the talented singer, songwriter, and guitarist who in 1980 co-founded the platinum award-winning band The Smithereens. Along with his bandmates Dennis Dyken, Mike Mazaros, and the late Pat Denizio, our guest performed in over 2,500 live shows on stages from coast to coast and around the world. And while the band appeared on shows including Saturday Night Live and The Tonight Show, their music could also be heard in more than a dozen films. And now, the band just released The Lost Album, a new LP of previously unreleased music recorded in 1993. And even more good news, you can see the Smithereens perform live on tour. Visit officialsmithereens.com for tour dates and more information. Please welcome to the show, Jim Babjack. Hello. Hello. I was just mentioning to you that our show, you know, celebrates... 1980s pop culture, but also how it's continued to influence today, today's media. Mm-hmm. And you said yeah. that you never thought of your, your, I guess the smithereens as being part of the 1980s. How, how is that? No, I, I didn't feel like we fit in at all. Yeah. And huh. matter of fact, when our first album came out, I went to a record store and uh, I was looking under rock for uh, our album uh-huh. And and they said, oh, that's, it's in the alternative section. And I'm like, oh. what the hell is alternative? <laughs> I, I didn't know what that was, but apparently the replacements, R.E.M. and us and a few mm-hmm. other bands. Well, because when our first album came out, the, the charts were, it was Madonna, Michael mm-hmm. Jackson, and uh, sure. mm-hmm. what, Duran Duran, I, I don't know. Yes. Like we, we, we stuck out like a sore thumb. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Fair. So that's why I say that. Yeah. I think we were out of our, uh, not in the right time. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. So if you had to pick an era, what do you think you, your, your music would fit into? Then? Yeah. Now, baby. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you say that maybe slightly tongue in cheek, but you know, and we're going to talk about the, the new, although it's quote unquote new uh, album from the Smithereens, but there mm-hmm. is something timeless about rock and roll and timeless about your music. And I think yeah. it was a quote that I heard. I saw, I think in every Pat where he said that, you know, he wanted to create music that could just always sound good and be popular. And Well, yeah, mm-hmm. I guess that's what we're striving for uh, to, to make timeless rock and roll records yeah. mm-hmm. uh, that stand the test of time. You know, my, my, my son, and this goes back probably 15 or more years when he first started driving, he pulled into the driveway and, um, he was blasting, uh, cream Mm -hmm. and I'm like, you, you like that, that old stuff. And he goes, yeah, I love it. I've been raiding your CD collection. Oh, nice. (laughs) <laughs> that's a good parent. We often judge, yeah. pa- we often judge, that sounds terrible, but we often judge parents on how, what music they raise their children on. <laughs> well, I, my uh, youngest, he's 28 now. He's a biomedical, he's a scientist. He's mm-hmm. brilliant. Nice. But when he was five years old, I gave him a, a little um, 45 player, the, mm-hmm. the one with the flip top. Yes. And I gave him a whole bunch Aww. of singles and I just let him go to town on it. I said, just play whatever you want. That's and uh, he would play both sides. He would mm-hmm. scratch the records. It was, <laughs> and to this day, he it's great. He buys new vinyls, so he's turning me on to bands like um, uh, Tame and Pala and mm-hmm. uh, Rival Sons, and uh, oh. you know all, all these newer bands that I right. never would have heard of otherwise. But they're great, you know. And I and now I have more vinyl than I should. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. You, yeah. 
we were talking, we were talking, we talk about this often on the show about vinyl and about 45s, but my daughter who's 12 mm-hmm. recently asked for a record player and it really shocked me. Not, be, be, not that we haven't talked about it. I talked about having turntables as a kid and, but mm-hmm. she asked for a record player and then we were looking for records at a, and I said, we're going to go to a vintage store and look for records. Okay. And they'll have some newer stuff. And she picked out Harry Styles, but then she yeah. said to me, I want to find a Beatles record. I said, why, why the Beatles? She said, I heard that they're great. (laughs) Which, which Beatles can you recommend? Now she's heard me play the Beatles. Yeah. But that question of which Beatles do you recommend? It's like, uh, there's so, you know, over the course of their career, it's so different. Where do you, you almost have to start her at the beginning so she could be eased into the later stuff, I think. But, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but yeah, uh, yeah, Yeah. no. And so we started listening to the Beatles. My 12 year old loves it. Catchy stuff. Jim, you mentioned, um, you know, about your being introduced to newer music. I have a 19 year old son who's not into vinyl. But he does introduce me uh, through our streaming, our music streaming to, yeah. you mentioned Tame Impala um, and there's a number of other bands I yeah. never would have known anything about if it weren't for having, having him putting my attention on it. And there's good yeah. stuff out there. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, you know, the, mm-hmm. yeah, it's there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I yeah. often lament how hard it is to find new good music because it seems like what's charting is, I don't know. Like I sound like an old man complaining about it, but it just seems <laughs> terrible to me. Uh, what always, Kat's heard me say this a million times now, what struck mm-hmm. me about the 1980s as, as a curiosity, and I do think that that was the 10 year span that bore the best in pop culture across various media, including music, was mm-hmm. that things politically, socially were not great for everybody, but the music was often happy and celebratory and uplifting and positive today. Mm-hmm. And maybe it's post nine 11 or something that all the music sounds so downbeat and minor keys, even the hip hop, it sounds, you know, like someone's got something is sad. Oh boy. Well, mm-hmm. a lot of our songs were minor key. Well, <laughs> true, but there's <laughs> blood and roses. You yeah, know? sure. Ooh, I yeah, guess yeah, only yeah. a memory is probably minor key, right? Well, actually it's made. Is that little, right? Only memories major. Is it, is yeah. right? Okay. But besides right. that, maybe it's the content of what people are singing yeah, about yeah. and, Mm-hmm. And I could understand what Pat was singing. Music nowadays, people mumble. All right, that's it. I'm done complaining. I got it. I got <laughs> it. Well, what we always said, we always thought that in in uh, relationship stories, it's always uh, more interesting if it's um, if it's not a happy relationship. Mm-hmm. There's well, not certainly. much to write yes. about. There's not much to write about if you're happy. It's like, oh, I'm happy. <laughs> yeah. You, you have a good point. There's story and conflict. Yeah. 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 So since we're an 80s show, you know, it's it's just perfect that the band got together in the 1980s. Um, mm-hmm. And I know that, well, uh, three of you, right? You and Dennis and Mike met in high school. Uh, yeah. And Carter, and by the way, Kat and I are from New Jersey originally. I'm from Jersey City. Mm-hmm. All right. Kat, you're from? I, I was born in Orange, and then, uh, but I spent most of my childhood in Belmar, New Jersey at the shore. Oh, nice. Yeah. Very different areas. of for, you know, let's just, sure. We should dispel a myth here, Jim. <laughs> What Do, does anybody outside of New does anybody in New Jersey ever say what exit are you from? <laughs> no, no. All right, okay. <laughs> oh, people say I that. never heard. I only heard that once I started traveling. Yeah, mm, mm-hmm. and and I'm like, uh, oh yeah, that's funny. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like it would mean anything to the person who asked you, you know, it's a uh, 14 a, all right. What is right. that for you? Right. Well, that's the turnpike. <laughs> that's not even the parkway. All right, whatever. Um, but you guys, so you met in high school and I note that you, you, you know, you're, 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 you start the bands credited as forming in the 1980s, but then you're, you know, young men, you're young adults in your early twenties, but you met in high school. What was the journey from, I guess, high school students to formalizing yourself as a band. Well, I, Dennis and I started uh, playing together in 1971. Okay. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we were already playing for nine years before we met Pat. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mike was a, a childhood friend of Dennis's also. And I knew him because we had the same accordion teacher when we were seven. And I'm talking 1964. Accordion. So- my dad gave me accordion lessons and then I had oh. violin lessons. I had to talk him into getting me a guitar and by 1969. <laughs> so, uh, wow. Uh, so Dennis and I were playing and then Mike, uh, mm. you know, saw us having a good time. Just the two of us. We were like the white stripes. It was, right. just, it was just guitar and drums for all these years. Yeah. We even played some parties like that. Okay. Wow. And, um, uh, like stuff from the Who's Tommy and, you know, we do everything instrumental. Mm-hmm. So uh, Mike decided to pick up the bass. So I taught him a couple of songs on the bass and then he went off to college and he comes back after one semester and now he's playing like 
Paul McCartney, John Entwistle, Joey, Dee Dee Ramone, wow. uh, James Jamerson all rolled up into to a ball. And <laughs> he was like a world class player all of a sudden. Nice. But I, I think it's because <clears throat> of the background we had is um, accordion. Wow. <laughs> <You know? laughs> the gateway <to> the instrument. <laughs> that is amazing. <laughs> So how is it that you come to meet Pat? Now, look, for folks don't know, you got your Carter, right? And a couple of towns over, you got your Scotch Plains. Yeah, we, we tried a couple of different lead singers in our town and okay. it didn't work out. So Pat, uh, Dennis put an ad in, in a local paper, mm-hmm. a musician's paper. Mm-hmm. And Pat also had uh, an ad in there looking for a band. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. So it was like, oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, it kind of worked out. That's you know, okay. in, instant band, just like that. Is that yes. right? It, yeah. It, it was the, uh, so I guess this is what the end of the seventies or it is 80 when you, when you finally come together. Yeah. De- the, the ad was placed in 1979 and by 1980 in March, we, uh, played our first gig as the smithereens wow. and, um, put out our first record, I think in that October, like mm-hmm. our independent record. And is the chemistry, I mean, you have an instant band, but is the chemistry fairly, you guys just hit it off? I mean, the three of you already had developed, I guess, a relationship, but then you got to add Pat to the mix. Yeah, no, it it it, uh, it fit like a glove. Oh. We we had a repertoire already of songs mm-hmm. and then uh, Pat mm-hmm. had some original songs that we, uh, you know, added to and, and then uh, kept going from there. Yeah. But the, the cover songs that we did back then, people didn't know uh, that they were, they thought they were original songs because we oh. did obscure songs by the Bo Brummels and the Birds and stuff. Okay. That, okay. B-sides. Okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. No, we didn't do we didn't do hit songs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No. <laughs> now was that was that a calculated effort to <laughs> seem like an original band? No. No. It's yeah. just stuff that we <laughs> liked. liked. Okay. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. we never. I, it's like it's like one of those things where uh, I'd like to hear a band do that song. Yeah. You know. Oh. Mm-hmm. And, so we're, mm-hmm. you know, it's obviously we have the pa- we have passion for for music. Sure. Otherwise, mm-hmm. we wouldn't be together anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, to stay together this long, you have to have uh, the passion for it. Absolutely. So nowadays, because of technology, because of the internet, music production is democratized. Pretty much, you don't need anything but internet access. There's free apps. You don't even need to play an instrument anymore. You could use loops and samples and stems. <laughs> Uh, how, what is it like to get an independent record done in the, in the early 1980s, though, as a startup band? Money, money. <laughs> yeah, basically. I mean, uh, you know, we'd find a, a studio that was reasonable, maybe $50 an hour. But by the time we did our albums in the 80s, yeah. our budget was uh, like in the 300,000s, wow. you know, mm-hmm. for the, the Girl Like You, that album and, sure. and the other album. It was mm-hmm. it was way up there. And then the videos that went with it were all between fifty and seventy five thousand dollars each. Wow. <laughs> and we did like four for each album. So that's why we never got any royalties. Oh gosh. Uh, you oh, know, it all went to that. Right. Yes. And, and the then counting. you know yeah. you so you have so the record company tells you that you have to do these videos, but then MTV decides, oh well, you know, we don't really like that one. We're not gonna put it into rotation. So you just uh, spent fifty thousand oh, wow. dollars for and Kiss the goodbye. No you know, oh. That's that's the music business back then. I can see why that's mm. terrible. And then the music and the record companies billing you right to pay for the videos. They're not. It's not Hell a yeah. part of their marketing. No. Uh, um, that said, it was. I believe it was a music video right for an MTV that helped launch your career. Yeah, the blood, the, the blood and roses video. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, we got lucky with that because radio was happening at the same time. Uh, New York picked it up, and then all the other. Uh, cities picked up on it as snowballed Mm -hmm. and it it was in a movie uh, Mm -hmm. uh, called dangerously close so that first video they paid for the movie company Mm -hmm. paid for it okay and they flew us out to la and we did the video and um Mm -hmm. and i don't know it seemed to be uh what people were looking for at the time something different Mm -hmm. something other than uh like I said, Madonna or, mm-hmm. or Michael Jackson. What keeps a band going? So, you know, we talked about you started in 1980. It's 1986 that you have your first uh, record deal and your first album is released. What kept you guys going? Stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, we, we just had, we just all had a common goal and uh, mm-hmm. we were hell bent on uh, getting a deal. We, you know, we, we did this for six years, you know, before we had a, a deal, We're putting out yeah. independent records, going up to Boston and, and Ohio. We, we tried um, 
you know, just getting in the car and playing these clubs. Yeah. It was just, uh, you know, we were just trying everything. We, we even had a chance to go to uh, Scandinavia in 1984. Wow. And uh, we were there for a month. We played in Finland and Sweden and Norway. Okay. And, um, and, uh, and then uh, Rolling Stone gave us a three and a half star review for our independent record, Beauty and Sadness. So we thought, hey, this is, this is great. You know, <laughs> but nothing happened. <laughs> so, you know, we were on the verge of, you know, I don't know about giving up, but it was, it was hard. And mm -hmm. to show you like the, the last when we when we sent out demos for the six songs that we did at the record plant, yep. by that time we weren't even putting a photo in the, or no bio, nothing, just, just a damn cassette with a phone number. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because <laughs> we, we used to have the like the Rolling Stone review and all these other little stupid reviews we used to get. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, I hate to call them stupid because back then they were like, wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so we kind of, at that point, we're like, all right, the hell with it. If they either like the music or they don't. Mm -hmm. And maybe that was good. Maybe because yeah. they didn't see what we looked like. Maybe that's why they signed us. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> like we can't put these guys in music videos that we're going to make them pay for right uh, yeah we do have some questions from Aww. folks on the internet we'd let everybody know we're going to talk to you and so um and some of these go back to some of the earliest uh let's see the beginnings of your uh beginning here oh here we go so from mark piritano mark piritano asks what was the first guitar you ever played if i go back uh my dad won this hawaiian guitar huh. in a poker game I think it had like a, you know, like a slide. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> wow. So making noises on that. And then all of a sudden he didn't have it anymore. I said, dad, what happened? And said, well, I lost it in the poker game. Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but my, oh, my first guitar was a cheap, uh, it's called a Tisco or something like that. And wow. uh, it was horrible. The strings were really far away from the neck and it came oh. with this plastic amp and uh mm. it was just garbage is that the one that you had to wrangle your dad for or convince him that you, you could have a guitar that was it yeah yeah <laughs> he went to a department store and bought mm -hmm. the department store special yeah mm -hmm. it was just <laughs> crap you know <laughs> I've had so many Christmases like that where I asked my parents for one thing and they got me the off brand version. Yeah, well, you know, what, what, a funny story is uh, my dad knew I was into records and I, I gave him a particular, he was going to the store and I, I gave him a particular record I wanted to get. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember what it was now, but he comes back with five other records and, and I go, what, what's this? He goes, well, these five records cost just as much as the one you wanted. So it's a good bargain. I'm like, Dad, I don't want this uh, Hank Snow record or whatever the hell it was. Now, it doesn't work that way. Right. Oh, man. That's the way my dad looked at it. So according to Kurt Cobain's own book, he was a fan of the Smithereens and in particular of your guitar playing. Uh, according to Butch Vig, who produced uh, Nevermind, Nirvana's uh, Nevermind, uh, uh, confirmed this story that he would listen to your playing to try to emulate it. So along those lines, we got uh, two questions here. Uh, Joe Hammond asks, is there another guitarist that you uh, try to emulate uh, their playing style? And similarly, we got a question from our friend on Twitter, 80s Radio Man, asking who inspired you to play the guitar? Well, when I was a kid, uh, well, it was a combination. It was more maybe Pete Townsend, uh, mm -hmm. I never wanted to play like uh, Jeff Beck or Hendrix or, or Eric Clapton because I they had their own thing and and with Townsend he uh, I like the way he plays solos uh, they're mm -hmm. like chord leads and I, I kind of gravitated mm -hmm. towards that and and the Beatles uh, the way mm -hmm. well I thought George Harrison played the solos on some things but now I find out well a long time ago, I found out it was Paul McCartney that played yeah. the solo on Tax Man, uh, uh, probably yeah, yeah. Hey Bulldog. But you could tell because uh, uh, now that I, I know what he sounds like on his like mm. on the McCartney solo record, that's his style. Mm -hmm. But um, no, I never tried to emulate anybody. Uh, it was just everything. I, I absorbed uh, everything. Mm -hmm. If I were to name one, I guess Pete Townsend, because mm -hmm. uh, when I mm -hmm. when I was uh, fourteen, that was my uh, my go to. I wanted okay. to play that. Yeah. Power chords. Now we know when you were a kid, your dad owned 
Bab Jack's Corner Tavern in, Ca- oh. in Carteret, and that you would be there on occasion. Right? Well, yeah, um, I guess when I was about fifteen. Yeah, I'm wondering if mm-hmm. if music was there was there live music there or a jukebox or music playing there that somehow seeped in. Yeah, well, my dad played accordion. Uh, we at were the, going at back the bar. To the wow. uh, my parents always had parties. They always had people okay. over. Mm-hmm. I'd go to sleep um, to music all the time, and oh. well, so we lived on top of the bar, and you oh. can imagine closed at two and three on the weekends, mm-hmm. and all I heard was uh, billiard balls and uh, people <laughs> fighting and <laughs> oh, no. talking loud, and, and the jukebox, of course. Mm-hmm. So when my dad sold the, the bar in 1980, I kept the jukebox, and it's oh, in my wow. in my house right oh, now. Oh, you have no it. Kidding. Does it have oh. the same records in it that it did then? No. No. <laughs> my own records in there. <laughs> you, you're right. You, you switched them out. <laughs> well, you know, by, by the time I was tending bar there when I was 18, yeah, I, I used to put records in there. And mm-hmm. uh, I used to goof on people. Like I had Can't Explain in there by The Who, but I, instead of saying The Who, it said The High Numbers. And, uh, <laughs> and I put these Mexican Beatle EPs in there so they had two songs on each side. <laughs> So it was an eclectic jukebox. Yeah. Uh, Joe Martin asks, which do you favor, your Ricky or your Telly? I guess it's your Rickenbacker or your Telecaster. (laughs) Uh, It's like having a mistress or something. Um, (laughs) I won't tell the other. Well, there's, there's, I like them both. And, and the thing is, I I don't like the, the Ricken, well, it's hard to answer because the, the Telecaster is, is versatile. I could I could use it on on hard rock. I could use it on ballads just by switching mm-hmm. things here and there. The Rickenbacker, I could only get that one sound out of it, mm-hmm. and I don't like to fly with it. Uh, since nine eleven, I haven't flown with it because mm-hmm. gotcha. well, I did once, and then you know they opened the case. And there's like like oh. taking everything apart. I'm like, right. don't even look at it. Don't. Mm-hmm. This, this guitar yeah. is too good for you to even look at. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. I only use that for local gigs, and then I'll take the Telecaster on the fly gigs. I could just put it right above my head, and it's exactly. versatile. It's easy to change the strings and all mm-hmm. that stuff. Let's see. I got a question here from Kevin. I want to say Westman? What's your favorite venue you've ever played? Mm-hmm. Damn. Well, you know how how do you pick a favorite anything like with yeah. the guitar <laughs> or the this or that? Yes. You oh. just lie and you pick one. <laughs> well, there are places I do enjoy playing. I, I enjoy mm-hmm. playing the State Theater in Falls Church because, mm-hmm. and I'll tell you why, it's because um, people could stand in the front and they mm-hmm. could sit in the back. Mm-hmm. So for me as an artist, if people are standing in the front, I play better or I just, oh. it's more exciting for me. Right. And, and and I don't like those barricades either. Like I'll usually tell them like, get rid of those barricades. I want mm. people right up against the stage. Right. So, um, yeah. Um, the, I like the theaters and, and, uh, I don't know. What was it like being a Jersey boy to then play at the Meadowlands? Um, <laughs> I, it was fun. I, uh, I, I had a wireless system at the time and I, I used to go out into the audience during, well, I, when, I don't do it anymore, really. Mm-hmm. During Blood and Roses, I'll go out and um, play in the audience. So at the Meadowlands, I uh, I ran off the stage and I ran around the whole circumference of the of the arena and did this really long solo. And people were running after me, security. Oh boy! <laughs> I jumped back on stage and finished the song. It was uh, <laughs> tremendous. I I thought we were going to be doing more of that sort of thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Mm-hmm. I, I thought for sure you were going to say it was like in Spinal Tap when Chris Guest he starts getting like the radio interference. You remember like there's like a, oh. you hear like a cop car go by and his wireless. He's doing <laughs> yeah, a solo. And people breaking in. Oh, you did? You started getting yeah. some. They, they say it's better now, but now I'm just hooked up to uh, yeah. with a cord. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, uh, a favorite venue. Yeah. Radio City. Um, now I'm mm-hmm. thinking, okay, Radio City was a great, great place to play. We, we have played a lot of historic type uh, theaters like yeah. uh, the Fox Theater in Atlanta where they were gone with the wind premiered. And okay. oh, certain venues are just you walk in and you go, wow, this is really uh, great. This, there's a lot of history here. Uh, we certainly you know? want to talk about the new album, but you guys have been look. On, sadly, we lost uh, Pat uh, in 2017, uh, the lead singer. But you guys have found a way to get back out there again and uh, including having uh, 
uh, Robin from the Gin Blossoms, lead singer from the Gin Blossoms, pitch in. You also have another 1980s icon, Marshall Crenshaw, as uh, you know, filling in on. And, and it's what it varies from from performance to performance. Whether you've got one or the other, or sometimes both. How did you come to uh, first meet Marshall? We opened for Marshall back in 1980 or 81 at oh, South okay. in, wow. in Asbury Park. Nice. So I think there's a newspaper clipping of it somewhere. And uh, so we've known him from the, the beginning. Mm-hmm. And then he helped us out with some demos in the early 80s. Right. And then when we recorded uh, our album in 1985, the one that came out in 86, he right. played keyboards on it. And he played uh, a baritone guitar on White Castle Blues uh, a track oh, on there. Song. And um, <laughs> so we've been friends since then. Mm-hmm. And, uh, Robin okay. Wilson, we met uh, at an in store in Arizona mm-hmm. in 1988 during the Green oh, wow. tour. He was a clerk there. He wasn't a Gin Blossom yet. No kidding. But him and his future Gin Blossom bandmates came to see us uh, at the in Phoenix that night, mm-hmm. and there, there's pictures of us from that in store with a young Robin Wilson with long hair, oh. and skinny. And <laughs> Isn't that something? So you know, <clears throat> so we did a, a tribute to Pat um, a couple of months after he died, and we enlisted all the singers that we know to sing a few songs. Mm-hmm. And after mm-hmm. the show, uh, Rob, both Robin and Marshall came up and said this was a lot of fun. Uh, it was so great. So if you guys ever want to do any shows in the future, just, you know, I'm there. So mm-hmm. that's kind of how that happened. And now we're writing songs uh, for uh, a new Smithereens record to come out someday. Mm-hmm. Uh, brand new songs. No kidding. So I started working on that during COVID. And you point out that you're going to have new songs because the Smithereens just released a new album, mm-hmm. but it's not, it's new to us. It's not new to you, Jim. Can you explain? Not really. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you just don't want to. Yeah, of course I can explain. Uh, it, it's, it's, you know, just a matter of life getting in the way. Uh, so what happened in, in, as a matter of fact, Butch Vig, right? I was, he was slated to do our next album for Capital after um, the blow up record, which by the way, sold 350,000 copies, but Capital thought it was a flop. So they yeah. just they drop us. And they also considered us old because, wow, I was 30, you know. And uh, so they wanted younger, grungier bands. Mm. And uh, But anyway, so we did a Christmas single, uh, 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 Rudolph Red Nose Radio with Butch Vig to mm-hmm. work, see how we work with them. And uh, I still hear it sometimes in a supermarket around Christmas time. <laughs> so, <clears throat> you know, he's the one that told me also about the uh, – about Kurt Cobain, which I didn't know at the time. Oh. Uh, so this goes back to, to 93. So I was like, yeah, I'd love to meet him someday. And then, then he died. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I was sending de- demos to Butch Vig, talking to him on the phone. All of a sudden he stopped calling and I knew something was wrong. Oh. So I think that <clears throat> the new president of Capitol probably told Butch to, uh, Hey, we're going to drop these guys. So hmm. don't bother. Uh, Yep. talking to them yeah. so uh, they dropped us and uh we as the survivors that we are we went in and uh we were gonna just record everything we had at the time and put out a record ourselves you know that's what you do right. uh and uh we ended up with two albums worth of material and then wow. when we got signed to rca we took half of them and re-recorded them and this other half we never did anything with uh pat took two of the songs and put them on his solo record and then we re-recorded i'm sexy for uh the date with the smithereens album but it didn't make it it was a bonus on the uh, vinyl set uh so other than that uh everything is is new and forgotten and then we moved on and did other things and um it was left behind you know Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i did a tell pat maybe we had this like rarities album come out uh i said you know i suggested maybe putting some of that on there and i don't know we would just uh some the dro- the ball got dropped there somewhere mm-hmm. so it almost made it out some of it anyway but here it is we so we have a dat of it we couldn't remix it all we could do is master it 
Mm. Because uh, whatever the mix was where we left it is, that's it. There's right. nothing we could do with it. Mm-hmm. So that's why it's sort of unfinished. Well, I, I hate to tell the public that it, it's unfinished because I want that's them to buy true. the record. Yeah, well, it sounds fantastic. I mean, it uh, sounds finished. That's all you need it, to yes. know. Yeah. <laughs> and especially to a lay person who just enjoys music. Yeah, it sounds, it's finished. Yes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so why now? What, what uh, you know, it's, it's been since you said originally recorded this in the early 1990s or mid 1990s. Um, I always felt like it should come out. I, I even told Pat about it, uh, you know, when he was still alive. And uh, I don't know, as an artist, you want to always, always put new things out, the freshest things. And uh, it, it was so long ago. But then listening to it now and after Pat's death, we're like, you know what? People are going to want to hear this, mm-hmm. you know? So I mm-hmm. think maybe, and it's good. So I like hearing it and I, I figured our, our fans would like hearing it and maybe we can do some of it live. You know, I think yeah. we're going to work up a couple of songs to do live. Oh, and it, sound, mm-hmm. it sounds mm-hmm. great. And it's kind of, it's kind of this weird, surreal experience because it's, again, it's new to us, but it's iconically the smithereens. Mm-hmm. there's Pat again, like uh, it's almost uh, uh, supernatural, you know, that he's saying and singing these words that we've never heard him sing before. It's, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't want to sound, you know, uh, macabre to say it's, sound, it's like from the beyond, but it's, it's, ma- yeah. it's magical in that sense, you know, mm-hmm. and his, mm-hmm. the, especially with the nature, this is the quality of his voice, the tone and everything. And, and again, like we were saying at the beginning of this, it's timeless, you know, it's just like good old rock and roll. You know, you've got a little, it's, some of it sounds a little Beatles ish, Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. I think Pretty Little Lies has got a little Buddy Holly maybe in there. Oh, definitely Buddy Holly, yeah. I mean, yes. it's, it's really fantastic. That's what we were going for on that. As a matter of fact, Dennis mm-hmm. reminded me that he wasn't even there for that. I, I played the uh, a cardboard box uh, for the drums on that. <laughs> Just like uh, Buddy Holly used hand uh, hand slaps on, on his knee right. on, uh-huh. on, uh, uh-huh. every, every day. But uh, yeah, so he was definitely trying. We were definitely trying for Buddy Holly on that one. Mm-hmm. And then uh, Face the World with Pride. I don't know. That riff kind of sounded like the monkeys or something. <laughs> but at that time, uh, we were just recording everything that we had. Mm-hmm. And uh, and there's so many different styles on this record. It it, it almost I, don't, I guess it belongs together because they are together. But <laughs> maybe that's why we didn't use them for the RCA record that came out. Hey, folks, if you love the Smithereens like we do, make sure you check out their new quote unquote new record, the Lost mm-hmm. Album, and. Don't miss them on tour at a venue near you. Visit Mm officialsmithereens.com and find out where you can see them. Uh, Jim, thank you so much for not only bringing us, look, you said at the beginning that you didn't consider that you belonged in the 1980s. To us, you do, because, you know, for us, uh, we associate so much of your music with the good feelings we had during that decade, you know, coming up during those years. And for continuing to bring us uh, new music today. Thank you so much for your time, Jim. Thank you. We got to keep moving forward, right? Quite honestly, I could have spoken to him for another 45 minutes or so. Yeah. Um, it's just great to speak with people that, uh, well, not look, we appreciate his music. So we're a fan of the music. So of mm-hmm. course, but also just a guy who's like, uh, you know, so great at his craft, uh-huh. you know, and so uh-huh. knowledgeable. Mm-hmm. Like I read so many s- interviews and stories with him talking about how he got a particular sound for this one song, uh-huh. this combination of guitar and amp, mm-hmm. you know, and then in mm-hmm. concert, he did this other, oh my gosh, just like, so many things. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a little crass, but I've heard that called competency porn. And I get it. It's like yeah. watching someone who's incredibly good at something just mm. do it and do it well. Yeah. You know, it's like, wow, <laughs> it's, it's, it's just beyond like, okay, you can watch a carpenter, you know, making a table. But when you watch uh-huh. someone that is a craftsman who uh-huh. does, you're like, whoa, like, how did you do that? And it's just, they've mastered the craft. Yeah, that's uh-huh. that's something that it never gets old for me. I'm not sure yeah. I can get over the name you just called it, but competency <laughs> porn. Yeah. yeah, my fifth favorite category. Don't look it up. Porn Don't hub. search for it. Uh-huh. Do not look. <laughs> Pornhub <laughs> competency <laughs> porn. I, I now I just got to know what. Hang on, folks. Let's just do this right here. Let's see. Hey, cat, can we do another one of those live review things? Oh. <laughs> First, enable safe search, please, please. <laughs> cat, were you going to say something about Jim? Um, I was just going to say he, he was so chill, just so, yeah. yeah so yeah. easy, relatable, just yeah, yeah. easy to chat with. Yeah. 
Mm. It was really it's got to be the New Jersey in him. You Absolutely. Know, just, oh, it's definitely so the real. That's, <laughs> yeah, he was real. <laughs> oh, so now Kat and I have something in common, John. Honk, honk. <laughs> What's this a sound of? Meh, meh. Oh, <laughs> bluk, my bluk, goodness. Bluk, bluk. <laughs> get some soap on your hands. Now, wash them up and get you. Yeah. Cat, send us home. Take us home. Do it. If you I want. will do that I because don't. our show yeah. is brought to you every week. Thanks in part to our early adopters like mm. Kathy Burke, Rick mm -hmm. Parker, and Karen Flieger. And thanks especially to our secret of our success level Patreon supporters, John Henderson. Mm -hmm. And I really want to say the next name with more enthusiasm because last week, you did last week I, I know it was a dud. <laughs> Poor Craig Coletta. He canceled his he canceled his his a support. Oh my gosh. I felt really bad listening to myself. Craig Coletta. I owe Coletta. him 50 bucks now. <laughs> Thank you, Craig. Wait, it doesn't cost 50 bucks to support us, by the way. That's, that's, that's <laughs> just, you're refunding months of yes, contributions. No, no, no. Right? That's right. Yes, 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 oh yes, yes, yes. Months and months. John Kaminsky, mm -hmm. Marcus Taylor, and mm -hmm. Tony Gray. Yay! Yay. Awesome. Very good. Thanks, guys. Okay, hey, thanks, thank you. guys. Yes, we certainly appreciate your support. You can find out more about supporting us if you'd like to, and you should, at 1980snow.com slash support. Mm -hmm. Hey, we will talk to you again next time on 1980s Now. Until next time. <laughs> Bye-bye now. This podcast is part of the 80s Ruled Network. Visit the 80s Ruled on Facebook for more 1980s awesomeness.